this is Dave Felbert. Welcome to Disc Golf and Honest Take, podcast number four. That's right, we're on our fourth one already. And this is a special podcast where we'll be covering the Next Generation exclusive player packs discs, as well as some new releases from Legacy and Infinite. And, you know, doing the usual mail call, giveaways, legends of the game, highlights, all those good things. So stay tuned and uh, let's get started. First things we always cover in our podcast is new releases. So um, for new releases this week, I decided to go with first the Legacy Pursuit. So this is a pinnacle pursuit from Le Legacy. It's one of their newer mid-ranges. And uh, they sent it to me as this is one of their hot sellers this year and new release. And I was out testing it, and let me tell you, just like every company, you got one of these smaller mid-ranges that looks like the max weight's more like 176 than 180, and they made it super overstable. I would compare it to something like a Gator or a, I don't know if it's Justice-like, but it's pretty close, you know. So I took it out to the field, and so did my group, and we threw it, and when you threw it flat, it went left, you know. And then, you know, I decided to try to test a little bit Anheuser into a headwind, and I just yanked on it, flexed. So I would say that, you know, if I was reviewing this disc, I would say that Legacy has come up with a really nice approach disc that's really overstable that you can use in headwinds and all conditions. It's got that smaller rim so that you can grip it, but it also has kind of that, you know, rockish type raised rim here instead of the curved rim you see in a lot of these discs. So I like that. It felt good in my hand. And I think that they've done something really good here. So um, good job to Legacy. This is their new release, The Pursuit. This is the Pinnacle Plastic one, which I think are more stable. And uh, if you haven't tried one today, get out and try it. Really good flyer. Really trustworthy into the wind. And I like this plastic. If you look at this plastic, it's taut. It's nice. It's champion-like, see-through type plastic, but it's grippy. So kudos to uh, Legacy and the Rico brothers over there. Did a real good job with their uh, new pursuit. They're in pursuit of making good disc, and they've done it again. Good job, guys. Now, another new release just got sent to me by Infinite Dis is the Centurion. And uh, this is in the splatter plastic. Sorry, it's got this weird reflection because it's so shiny. This plastic is really amazing. It's got that nice uh, star plastic feel, but the speckled effect that the Infinite Dis have. And uh, this is a new fairway driver that they come out with for their line. And um, when I was out testing it, it flew really good. I think this is going to be an instant fit into my bag. Um, I threw it nice flat with a little bit of hyzer, and it flipped up to straight, went straight, and landed straight. When I exposed it into a headwind, yeah, it kind of turned into a roller and cut rolled out. So it's not your big headwind disc, but this is going to be great for tunnels, flip-ups, and it's a great fairway driver for all levels. When I had the rest of my team test this, they really liked this disc. They felt that this could be a disc that they wanted, you know, they like, Dave, do I have to give it back to you? I want to try it. I want to keep it. So I told them to head over Infinite and find themselves a Centurion when they come out. But I'm just saying that these are really good for all level players. And that's what, one of the things about Infinite Discs. Their line is sure there's some discs there that are good for the top pro players, but most of the discs are dedicated to the everyday player. And I think that that's the key to what they're trying to do is that, you know, Innova makes the, the top product for many years and partnered with them to make a line of discs that is more consumer friendly, that is not just focused on professional players, I think was a great idea. So I think they've done that here. I really like the disc. The team really liked the disc. And I just want to say thanks to my sponsor, Infinite, for sending it to me for testing. And just say, if you haven't tried one, go out and get a Centurion for a fairway driver. I think you'll be highly impressed. It's kind of like a, a, a hair more stable leopard and um, it's made out of this really good plastic today. So go out and try it. And uh, Centurion by Infinite Disc. Thanks, fellas. All right, now we're to the classic part of the podcast, the reviews. And like I said, this week, instead of picking, uh, you know, fairway drivers, which will be next uh, podcast, podcast number five, fairway drivers, we will uh, cover what you're getting in the NG player package for the exclusive events. They will change for the premier events, but... There's still about 80 exclusive events left, and I figure that many of you who haven't played in one or don't understand might be interested in what you're getting, and why not review them? I, I'm a, I apologize I haven't done it so far. So let's just start right here in front of me, and there will be some repeats, so let's get those out of the way. Stuff we have reviewed, and then we'll go over the stuff we haven't. But I'll show you each one. So the first one is the Legacy Recluse. Um, we have reviewed that. It's a very overstable, nice approach disc trying to be probably the most overstable approach disc that they have. 
It's got Cynthia's pretty artwork on it. They did a great job with it. It's the uh, the sparkle plastic that they got, the high premium. And this is a good looking disc. Like I said, we reviewed it in the past podcast. Goes left, trustworthy approach disc. Thanks, Legacy. Other ones that uh, we reviewed is the Emperor. This is the infinite version of what goes in the player's package. It has uh, my custom stamp here for the tour this year. It's the, spat the splatter plastic. It's a really nice pop-top distance driver. Very comparable to any destroyer that you would find. Just depends on what you like. But I, I kind of like this. It feels better in the hand, and I like this plastic. You know, I've already reviewed this one, like I said, but uh, let's, you know, if you're going to play and you choose Infinite, this is the one you'll get. So good job, Infinite. And uh, let's see what else we got here. We've reviewed the Corvette in the earlier ones, but this is the exact Corvette that you're going to get. The Corvette I showed was a little different. This Corvette is uh, a little less domey than the one that we reviewed. It's got that uh, really nice star plastic. They've put uh, the NG logo into their stamp to be creative. And, um, you know, I think it's a good disc. I continue to throw it, you know, in certain situations, tailwinds and, uh, you know, non-windy long tunnels and stuff like that. So I think it's a great disc. Uh, it's good for all levels, like I said, and uh, thanks to Innovo, as we've seen this one in the past. And uh, what else we got here on the table that we've seen? Um, th this buzz right here. This is the ESP buzz. Brought to us by uh, with the Macbeth symbol from Discraft. This is what you would get in the Discraft selection. Um, it's got the beautiful buzz stamp with the NG on there and Paul Macbeth's logo and all that good stuff. So it's also a swirl. Um, we reviewed it. Like I said, it's more overstable than I thought. I mean, it's buzz, so it's not, you know, so overstable you can't throw it. But I thought it had great integrity, and you could use it as like a flip-to-flat hyzer mid-range until you break it in. I'm sure it breaks into a great turnover. But uh, like I said, we reviewed this already great disc that's the ESP swirl buzz that you would get with the disc craft package now what else do we have on the table I think that's oh no we have two more okay we have kind of reviewed the uh, gateway prophecy as you can see Cynthia's beautiful artwork on it again um, the gateway prophecy is the one that you get with the gateway the only difference is the one I reviewed was more like the DX type chalky plastic the one that you'll get in the package is the premium. It feels somewhat like star plastic. Um, it's really quality. I think that you'd be surprised. Go out and get a Gateway Prophecy, you know, get our package. I think you'll be highly surprised on the quality of the plastic, how good it looks, how good it feels. And like I said, it's a nice overstable mid-range comparable to any rock or mace or anything like that. It's really trustworthy. You can count on it, and it goes up to that 180, so that's the kind I like. It's got that rim. So we've seen it before, but I just wanted you to see it in person. Here's the pretty stamp and the gateway prophecy. I think on the table we have one more that we've we've covered, and that would be the Costa Plasta Goat. And um, you know we covered the Charlie Goodpasture one last time, and I explained it to you. It's a nice understable comet type approach disc. You, you can count on it to hold the turn. You can count on it to go straight. Not much of a wind disc. The one we had before is the uh, swirl, and you and you may get a swirl. I think that they're you know they're mixed in, if you pick the Costa Plasta. And I just want to show you here's the uh, uh, the stamp and how it looks. Really pretty looking disc. Thank you Costa Plasta. If you're interested in reviews, check the previous podcast. But it's a good flyer. Try it. Now what's left is the four discs from the player package. This is that I didn't review yet, and I thought that hey it was important that we covered all of them in the podcast so that you know. You knew what you were getting. And in the future podcasts, we'll go over the premier pa uh, player's packages because I think that's also important so you can see the difference in the upgrade. But the discs that we haven't covered that are in the player's packages is the Dismania PD2. So it's a pretty classic disc, but they made a new run this year. That's why we picked it. He, you know, told me we were Dismania. We made a really nice poppy top run, which they did. And um, I was out testing this one, and I can tell you that this one flies really overstable. I was able to throw it, it hyzered out. Then I was able to turn it and flex it right into the headwind and it came out just on time beautifully. A really good flyer. My team really enjoyed the disc. You know, everybody loves uh, the way it feels, but for most of them it was a little too overstable. For the advanced player, he was able to use it for, you know, skip shots and overstable. And, you know, for the beginners it maybe be a little too much disc, but it's a great flyer utility disc for anybody into a headwind on a, a windy day, and it just feels really good. So this is the PD2 uh, for Next Generation Tour Player Package from Dismania, and uh, get one today. Try it out. Choose Dismania and get yourself the new pop-top PD2. Now, 
what I have left on the table, and I think this one's one of the prettiest ones. Let's give credit to MVP. Look at this stamp. How they did the foil within the foils and highlighted Cynthia's artwork. We got to give them a lot of credit, and we appreciate that. MVP is really, really good with their stamps, and they've gone uh, above and beyond trying to really make this a pretty disc. So thank you to MVP. Now, what disc is this? This is the Streamline Runaway Neutron Plastic. That's right. If you most of you know MVP is an overmold company, and that's what I've covered in the past, but this particular one is not an overmold. They've uh, extended their line. They make a separate line called Streamline, and this is one of their uh, new ones, and it's an overstable midrange. You know, I expected it for some reason to be understable because I didn't, you know, have any expectations, but when I took it out to the field, it's as overstable as any company's midrange. It went way left. It feels really good in the hand. It's somewhere between you know, the rock buzz type rim. It's got a little bit of a bend. It's got a little mark right here all the way around, which is different. And, uh, but their non overmold disc looks just as good as any other company. I couldn't really see any difference between theirs and the other brands. It's got a nice sticky plastic. For mid range, it's taut, but it's not gooey, but it has some give. I think a lot of people will like that. So, you know, um, this is the one you'll get if you pick MVP. It's the Streamline Runaway Neutron Plastic. And uh, make sure you try it. I think it's really cool. Um, I was impressed with it. And um, as I go, like I said, to break in new discs, and I'm looking for an overstable midrange to add to the bag for you know certain situations, I might reach for this one. I, I thought it was really nice. So thanks to uh, MVP. Now what's left is uh, what was sent to us by... Uh, latitude you know you have a lot of options but the majority of them are the musket so if you look here at the latitude if you choose latitude you would get their new musket which is a really good fairway driver i found it to be kind of similar to the centurion it was a little less stable than centurion so it turns a little more but it would hold a line i found it to be a really good fairway driver it was very predictable you know and it was a good addition to their line so i think it's great for uh, all players my testing team liked it at all levels thought they could find a use for it so I think that that, you know, is what we were looking for in the player's packages. And it's got the pretty art on it. They always do a good job with their stamping. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't tried a musket, go out and get this fairway driver. It's a great addition to the Latitude line. And this is, again, what you get if you pick Latitude with the uh, NG exclusive player package. So, again, thanks to Latitude for being a big supporter. Now, finally, and not least, but Prodigy. Uh, I've shown you some Prodigy discs this year, but not the one that you'd get in the exclusive players package which would be this one which is the uh kevin jones pa3 that's right it's pretty rare it was only made for us so it's a pa3 with the beautiful artwork of cynthia but they've also added kevin jones signature in his name here and these are the only ones that are like this in the country so if you choose the prodigy pack for uh the exclusive event then you'll get this disc which is pretty rare so if you're supporting kevin jones or you like this stuff you know, this is the only place you can get it. And i just tell you that when I went out and tested it, I could see why they liked the PA3. You know, it's not super overstable. It was a nice, straight, stable putter. I was able to throw it really clean on a nice straight line, and it landed flat, you know, and, and it hyzered a little bit when I put hyzer on it, and it anhyzered out when I anhyzered it. Um, for putting, you know, for me, maybe not the greatest putter. I like a lot of dome, so my hand's full, and I'm a push putter. But I think if you're a spin putter or someone who putts really hard, this could be a, a great putter for you. But overall, it feels good. It's made out of that um, DX-type plastic. They call it uh, 350G. So that's 350G plastic. It's got a nice swirl to it. Each one does. And let's give a uh, thanks to Prodigy for putting a nice effort into making a good player's package disc for this year's exclusive events. So if you want a Prodigy, this is the one you get. And uh, give it a try. It's a great putter and really popular with their team. So... Thanks to uh, uh, Prodigy for making a good product. Again, that we had the pro you could get the Prodigy PA3. If you go with Latitude, you'll get the Musket. Mm -hmm. If you go with MVP, you'll get the Runaway. If you go with Dismania, you'll get the Pop Top PD2, Costa Plus, Swirly Goat, Gateway. Really nice plastic privacy. Mm -hmm. Discraft, ESP Swirl Buzz, Innova, Star Corvette, mm. and Infinite, Splatter Emperor. So, some pretty good choices, and I just thought it was important for us to go over those. Um, I have, like I said, covered a few of the other discs that I, you know, quickly went over in the previous podcast, if you're interested in checking that out. 
It's in podcasts one through three. And I just want to say, you know, the whole idea is to give you guys selection. So we're trying to get uh, different discs from each brand, and I think we've done that here. And like I said, in the future podcast, I'll go over what's in the premier events. Now, you just don't get this disc when you're playing an exclusive event. You're also going to get a towel and a sticker and some other things depending on what uh, your TD selects. And there's a payout. So these are just the discs that would come in your player package. And I thought it would be nice for you guys to see them in person. So now you're when you're looking online and it has the drop-down menu and it says, you know, a disc craft, blah, blah, blah. You're not so curious. You're like, oh, yeah, Dave told me if I select the gateway I get that red prophecy so we don't want any surprises we want you to get what you you picked they're here in front of you they're on the drop down menu when you register and uh, like I said there's about 80 events left so get out there and play and uh, collect the whole set I think it'd be pretty cool to have all 10 all right this is the NG update giveaway part of the podcast as you know we do a little giveaway and we do a little update so for the giveaway we have a player played in three events already out of, I believe, Indiana, Illinois area, which would be Justin Teller, PJ number 68586. That's correct. He's played in three events, all in the Indiana, Illinois area. He's a big supporter. I think he's a, one of the top point earners. Um, and uh, thank you, Justin, for competing in our events. You were the one selected in the drawing, and uh, look forward for your package in the mail. Thanks, buddy. Now, on a quick update... As I always say, things are going good. We've got a lot of things uh, going, and we can't wait to tell you all about them. But one of the uh, things that we have going that we want to update is just to give a heads up. The premier events, which I and Cynthia have run in the past, the eight big events that we did um, in every region, which are A-tier level with but bigger payouts, those are all getting ready to start uh, now. We've had one already up in... Um, the Upper East Coast, they had a, a small one up there, and they're all getting ready to roll out. I'm doing one in Augusta, August 31st, one in Huntsville, September 28th and 29th, and there's about 20 across the country, all over the region. So just go to nextgendiscgolf.com and check our schedule, and you'll see all the premieres there, and don't miss out on them. They're also on PJ. They're either B tiers or A tiers, and uh, as you know, our payouts are always great. We do the free food, video coverage, and all kinds of CTPs and side games and interviews and the whole nine yards. If you want to go to a good tournament, head out to an NG Premier. And if you you know, are unsure, look at last year's NG Premier list of people that played in them and contact somebody and say, hey, did you enjoy the tournament? And you know, most of them I've talked to said they have. And if they haven't, then hey, give us some feedback and say, hey, uh, my buddy said it was no good, so I'm not coming. I'd be interested to hear that, but we're doing everything we can to make the premier events something that you can remember. So go ahead, check the schedule. Premier events are happening for the rest of the season. We do have some exclusive events still on the schedule, like I said, but the premier ones are starting to kick in. And those are the ones that have the, the big player packages and the most points and can get you points for AM Worlds and, and uh, the ones in the South are Southern National Qualifiers for next year. So. I think that you should uh, go ahead and check the schedule and uh, try to get out to a premiere so you don't miss out. Okay, we are in the part of the show we call Mail Call. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I get a ton of questions every week, and I'm sorry I can't get to all of them. So please don't get upset at me, but I'll do the best I can. But if I read it on the air, you know you got a question answered. So let's start this week. Uh, let me go to my list here and see what we got. Uh, looks like our first one is from Justin Litton. And uh, thank you for your question, Justin. You've been selected, so look for your package. Um, his question is, do you have any advice on how to overcome performance anxiety and still play with confidence when you're under pressure? And I think that's a great question, Justin, is that I find that, you know, through all the years of playing and practicing and, you know, traveling around the world with disc golf, I found that the majority of people have a lot of talent and they can throw a shot. I mean, you, you know, you go with them in the right moment, they can play as good as anybody. But it's performance anxiety that brings them down. And I think that all of us experience it. No matter who you are, you're going to have it. And if you don't have it, then probably competition's not for you. There's no such thing as a great champion who doesn't feel nervous or have some anxiety before they're getting ready to compete. That's how it kind of goes. So don't expect to not have any. The question is, how do you deal with it? And I think that the way I would answer it, and I'm not the know-it-all, but how I dealt with it in the past, and I read in some books, you know, golf books and stuff, is that it's energy. And you can choose to let that energy consume you and bring you down and make you sweat and not feel the shots and, and not do your best. 
or you can choose to try to take that energy and just keep it inside and swallow it down and, and have some self-confidence, like you said. Have, have a little self-talk. I know it seems a little egotistical or whatever, but you're trying to be the best you can be in an individual sport. So talk to yourself and, and tell yourself that you're going to do well and that you're about to win. And look at yourself in the mirror before the round of the bathroom and look yourself in the eyes and say, are you ready? Let's do this. Let's give them our best on every hole. You know, and really believe that you can do it. Say, hey, I've practiced. I know this shot. Walk up with that confidence like, oh, I'm going to throw it right there, right around that tree, and it's going to skip in the circle. You have to have that confidence to get over the anxiety. Now, if you can do that and you put together a couple shots in a row that are good, you can turn that anxiety into focus. And my best rounds are when I feel the most uh, anxiety, but then I put together a couple good shots, and then all of a sudden I go into the zone and I shoot those 1,100 rated rounds. And I think that that's why when you look at um, a lot of the featured cards, people are like, oh, it's unfair they're in the featured card. There's an advantage to that. Well, I think that is the advantage is because that you do feel nervous. And sure, usually in those featured cards, there's one player usually who doesn't have a great round. But the other three feed off off the, the energy and turn that anxiety into focus and usually put together some really hot rounds. That's why the featured cards, usually a couple of those guys are always in the top after the uh, first day. So... That's, that's how I would deal with the performance anxiety. Believe in yourself and can you know have some self-coaching and self-talk. But make sure that you've done the preparation, you have the right discs with you, you've practiced the hole. So there's no excuses. If you walk up to a hole and you have an excuse or you have a question, you're beat. You have to walk up knowing what you're going to do, knowing that you know how to do it. And if you have that and you can talk yourself into it, you can turn that anxiety into confidence. So I hope that answers your question, Justin. Now moving on to the second question. It was sent in from Stephen Lutz. He's a big uh, NG supporter. Thanks, Steve. And uh, he said, How are you able to pull off another world title while being so busy with the Next Generation Tour and having a family? And the second question to that was, What is a practice routine for someone like me like? Well, thanks for that question, Steve. And I think that the answer to that is, How is I able to pull off another world title? I think that when you get a little older and you've played, I played for 20 plus years and I did play a lot during that time period. It's kind of like riding a bike. I know people say that, but I kind of have the base skills down. So how I was able to win a world title was just a couple weeks out. I just started to polish up some of the things I knew that mattered. And when you played a long time, you know, like what makes a difference in your scoring. So for me, for example, short putting, you know, is something I know is important. And, um, you know, working on my Anheuser flip shots, like Heiser to turnover, are something that, you know, I get a little rusty with. So I went out and made sure those were working and practiced those. And I think that, you know, just polishing up on those things that I really need and then leading up to the event, being there a couple days early and really practicing hard. I know a lot of people come to events like that and they go and they do sightseeing and they go out to eat and they visit with friends, which is great. And I've always done that, you know, but what's really important is being prepared for the event. And if you went to the Masters Worlds and you were hanging out, you would see that, and you just had like a drone over the course, you would see that after everybody left every night, I was still at the course. You know, not killing myself practicing, or I'm so tired I can't perform, but I'm practicing putting, and I'm just becoming one with the property. And it's nice when you're standing out there at, you know, nine or 10 at night of a tournament night, and there's nobody else on the property, and you're standing by a basket, and you're just putting, and you and that's, you know, to, to the previous question, building up that confidence and giving yourself that ability to not have that anxiety the next day. So I think that that's the key for me is just really staying focused all week and not getting caught up in the extracurricular activities. I know that that's half the fun, but if you're there to win, which I was, then you have to stay focused on what you're there for. Now, how is it with my family and the NG Tour? Well, I have a lot of support. Um, the NG Tour, we have a lot of people helping with us. I, you know, I am running it, but I still have a lot of help. And sure, it takes a lot of time, but it's something I've been doing for a couple of years. And the new family, you know, that's great. It's not, you know, having us that there and having Cynthia and Leo Max has made me want to do more you know it's it's made me want that what I do go to the competition instead of just showing up to the you know the Masters World to taking third and being happy with the check and leaving you know I really wanted to win so that I had you know can increase my legacy for my child and so that he can look back and say hey when my father did something he, he gave it his best you know and I think that that is important so you know and also without her support and helping you know take care of him and be the mother that she is then I wouldn't be able to do it so really appreciative to her and everything she does and then what was my practice schedule like 
I really, I don't know. I, you know, like you said, with the NG and the family and other stuff like that, I'd rather be spending time with my family and hanging out with Leo, Max, and Cynthia and trying to do some activities like we're going on a little vacation next week. But that's what I'm interested in is, you know, trying some things like that with my family and enjoying life without a little bit of disc golf in it. I know that for you disc golfers, you're like, what do you mean disc golf? You know, li live, eat, sleep. I'll always play disc golf, and I'm not going to, you know, take away my interest. It's just that I like to, you know, open my mind a little bit and enjoy some activities that don't always have to include taking the disc with you. So that's how I'm able to uh, do it. For the practice routine, though, because of that, I'm not practicing. Like, I haven't, before the world's a month out, and since the world's, I haven't even gone to a disc golf course to play a practice round. And you think, well, maybe I putt in the yard, you know, a couple hundred times a week or something. No, I don't do much putting in the yard. I might throw a putt when I walk by the basket here and there, but nothing uh, like a routine or anything. And um, I think maybe that does cost me. I think that possibly if I did have a practice routine where I putted, you know, 50 times a night and threw into the net 30 times, that my game would be a lot better. And I probably have less injuries when I do play and all that different stuff. So, you know, I, I think that a practice routine is necessary, but I think once you get to a certain level of skill in almost anything, it's more about polishing up what you know how to do instead of practicing. Because practicing is helping you develop the skills you need, which I've already developed. So really it's more about polishing and making sure that I'm not rusty when I walk out to the event and I miss a 15-footer on the first hole because I haven't practiced enough to feel comfortable and make a 15-footer. So that's what I would say. So that's why I was able to do it, and that's what my practice routine is. And I'm not being cocky, like, oh, the guy won the world, he doesn't practice. It's just how it is. And I wish, you know, that, you know, that I could perform at 10, 60, 10, 80 golf and practice all the time, which I may do again someday. But currently, my life has got me in a different place, and I'm happy about it. And I'm happy to be able to show up to the events, polish the skills I have, and perform the way I did. So thanks, Stephen, for your question. And uh, for those of you, that was mail call. Send your questions to david.felberg at nextgendiscgolf.com. And like I said, if I read your uh, question on the show, you'll get a free package in the mail. So let's thanks again to Justin and Steven for uh, their questions. And that was mail call, podcast number four. All right. Uh, here's a section that of the podcast I like to call team highlights. I like to pick a player from each level of our team and talk about them a little bit. So for this week, from our national team, I've selected Ricky Wysocki. That's right. I mean, he doesn't need much of an introduction. You know, look at some of those stats. He's got 107 career wins. That's pretty good. He's only, you know, been playing not even a decade yet, I don't think. And he's already got $380,000 cash, which is amazing. I know the Palmy Best's up around four fifty. dollars Climo's around four thirty. dollars I think I'm at four fifteen. dollars but I think Ricky's fourth all-time with 380, and I think probably by the end of this year he'll be third all-time and pass me. I'm not sure, but as much as he plays and how well he plays, I could see that happening. Um, he has some career highlights that are worth mentioning. I mean, he's Ricky Wysocki, and he's very relevant. So I mean, But you know he's won the Worlds twice. He's got Japan Open titles, Australian Open titles, all kinds of international titles. I mean, he's played above and beyond. And this year... You know, hasn't been his strongest year, you know, with his end of a disc, he's made a switch, and it takes a little time to get used to that, but people are like, oh, he's not playing that well. 13 events, his worst finish is ninth, and he only plays in the big events, so he's never even finished out of the top 10 all season. So I think he's playing great. I know at his expectations, he wants to win all the time, but he has got to win. He won the Disc Golf Pro Tour San Francisco Open, which winning a Disc Golf Pro Tour every season is great for the resume, So, and he's got a chance to win a few more. And, you know, I think that you know, when you look over at Europe right now, he's over in Europe getting ready to play. That's something that's eluded Ricky. And I could see Ricky playing really well in Europe and trying to claim that European Open title to uh, round out his resume. So, you know, I just wanted to uh, give a shout-out to Ricky. I, I mean, I, we could go on and on about all the stats and his Rookie of the Year and Player of the Year and all these different things that he's done. But, you know, uh, just support the guy. You know, he's a nice guy. He's got his Saki Bomb challenges going across the nation. Um Go to those and check him out and uh, get to know him because he isn't going anywhere. He's probably the youngest, best player in the world, I think. I think that, you know, you got, people would say Eagle or others, but for what he's accomplished already at his age, there's nobody at that level yet. And in my opinion, he'll probably hold all the records in disc golf if he continues at the pace he does. So shout out to Ricky Wysocki on the NG national team. Thanks for your support of the NG tour and uh, good luck in Europe, buddy. Next um, would be from our uh, premier team, and boy, this kid is, you know, he's had a lot of uh, 
hype lately, and you know we've covered him on our website and stuff. But Noah Higgins from Alberta, Canada, just finished eighth in the 19 and under uh, worlds, which I know he wanted to do better, but it's still top 10. I mean, or 18 and under, I think it is. He still finished top 10, which is great. And worlds is always a long, grueling match, and he was able to best all the kids in the putting so he is the putting world champion and if you watch a lot of his highlights he makes a lot of putts on video and a lot of little clips so i wasn't surprised to see him as the putting world champion um let's look at some of his stats he started playing around 2016 and he already has 11 wins that includes a pro win and let me give you an idea of what how serious this kid is he's serious he's been traveling he's from canada but he's traveled to the u.s he's played uh nothing but professional events this year besides the AM Worlds. So he played in the AM Worlds, but besides that, he's been playing open and turning down the cash. And I think that he's doing that to gain a lot of experience, which I think is going to help him. Um, he, uh, in 2018, he played advanced, and he dominated quite a bit. Um, you know, from 2016 to 2018, he grew. He, he went through intermediates and different divisions. He was just a young kid. And by 2018, last year, he was dominating advanced. I'm not saying he won every time, but he always was winning or second or third in most events that he played in. So I think that's why he moved up to the Open. And like I said, he's had a solid year winning a C tier in the Open and would have cashed numerous times, but has declined it. So um, we just want to give a shout out to Noah Higgins, probably one of the bright spots of Canada and one of the top up and coming young players in the world. So look out for Noah because he's coming. And uh, thanks again, Noah, for supporting the next gen. And, team and being a part of our group so i always pick one from every team that's exclusive the team this time would be matt travis that's right from crown point indiana he's ng team and he's been playing since 2006 that's right that's a long time and if you look over his career you know he by 2009 he was dominating advanced in his local area like i said just like with noah he wasn't winning every time but dominating meaning that he was the guy to beat he won many of the events or was right there at the top and then he dabbled in pro, and he tried to break through to pro, it looks like to me, all the way up to about 2014, where he got his rating up to almost 980, 979, and he was, you know, competing at the pro level, trying, but um, it was declining cash and stuff like that. And then it looked like he had a little hiatus, whether he was injured or he got a little bored, and I think this happens to a lot of people. That's why I was talking about the semi-pro, is that they get to be like, like Matt, 980 level, and, you know, he's going to tournaments and he's not quite 1020 so he's not going to beat the Paul McBest when they come to town but he's obviously dominating advanced the year before so he doesn't know where to fit so I think maybe he got a little burned out it happens to many of our members but then he started to come back into the game and I, I don't want to take credit but I think next generation tour had a lot to do with that he started participating in the next generation tour and he started making the finals and being in videos and cameras and I think that it made him want to take it more serious again so now he's been striving to be serious again, and he's playing only professional events this year. He, he's played in 11. He's got three pro wins. His rating's back over 970. It was down to like 930. So he's back up over 970. He's got three professional wins, and, uh, you know, he is very active. So uh, Matt, keep sticking with it because we know that you got what it takes. You know, just keep going. And uh, overall, besides being a great player, he's an NGTD. He's run three or four events for us this year. He's a big supporter. He always posts stuff about the tour. And it's people like Matt that keep the tour going. So thanks, Matt, for all that you do for the tour. And uh, we're watching you, buddy. You're breaking through to the pro. I believe in you. Keep going. All right, to my favorite part, which is called Legends of the Game. <laughs> but I want to have a little preface about this uh, now. You know, I've done it now. This is the fourth one. When I'm talking about these Legends of the Game who have made the Hall of Fame, you know, I think that I'm not trying to start trouble, and I hope it doesn't cause any ripples, but... I think that the Hall of Fame is somewhat confused in what they've done. They've kind of mixed um, organizers, volunteers with players. And I think if you look at like the Baseball Hall of Fame and Football Hall of Fame, which is why we have one. We wouldn't have a Hall of Fame if these other sports didn't have one and set a precedent for the last hundred years. So, you know, that's where they got the idea for a Hall of Fame. And obviously, they have kind of separated it where when you walk a Baseball Hall of Fame, they have like their co organizational people that have made the sport happen and given their life to make it happen, whether on a volunteer level or not. And then they have their player level. And I think that that's kind of what we should do as a, a professional organization with our Hall of Fame. I'm not in charge, but I think we should have a player level and then a volunteer organizational give back level. And you could be in both. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you could very easily be someone like a 
Tom Monroe, let's say, that was good enough to be in the Hall of Fame playing and also good enough to be in the Hall of Fame as one of the starters and organizational aspects of the sport. So I think that that's one thing I want to preface. So a lot of the players that I've been kind of picking is uh, not players who are big in like designing courses, let's say, or running tournaments, but they were the, the, the players. And people who are into the Hall of Fame say to me, well, Dave, it takes more than just play. It takes all these other things like the things that you do. And I said, well, I understand that. But, you know, players like the ones I've mentioned, Ron Russell so far, Larry Leonard, Mike, you know, and the one I'm going to uh, mention today, they gave their life to the tour. So people are like, well, why didn't they design courses? Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? These guys were trying to win. And these were the guys who were winning every week, traveling week to week, showing up on Monday to the next property, practicing all week, being the ones that we videoed, being in the feature. And it wasn't for them pushing the tour forward. We wouldn't even have a tour today for these people to or volunteer for and do the organization and do all that stuff. It takes both. So to expect these really top players to have given back at the level that we're kind of saying they need to to get in the Hall of Fame, I think is a little off because it takes a high commitment to be the one who wins every week or try to win, be in the top, let's say, three or four, which the players I've mentioned have week in and week out for many years. So let's take that into consideration. I think that if they had stayed home and they were the type of guys who stayed at home and they were regional only, then they probably would have done more core stuff and stuff in their community. But they were hitting the tour week to week and taking disc golf to the mainstream so we could be where we are today. So I just want to say that. So that being said, the person I'm about to announce is my legend of the game for the uh, episode four. He, you know, hasn't given back to the sport in course design and stuff like that. But he gave back by being a touring pro, and he's been one for many years. And I know that many of you say, well, when I say his name, you'll say, well, oh, you have to be in good standing with the PDJ. He is in good standing. There was some discrepancies in his career here and there, but they were never uh, not in good standing. He's still in great standing with the PDGA, and he, and he, and he still is a, a legend of the game. So, but no longer being said, that would be Brad Junebug Hammock. That's right, Brad Junebug Hammock out of... Decatur, Georgia. And most of you that have been playing know who that is, and you're like, whoo, Brad Hammock. I mean, he was good. I mean, he wasn't just a flash in the pan. He's been playing pro since 1989, okay? 1989, he started playing open. In 1991, Brad was PDGA Rookie of the Year. I didn't win that. That's a pretty good award, so showed that he was an up-and-comer. In 92, he got his first professional win, and that was in a doubles tournament with the legend John Schiller, they won the world's doubles title in Michigan in 92. And then he also, you know, is a great doubles player. So he claimed another title in 04, San Saba, Texas, with Kevin McCoy. Now, when you look at Brad's singles career, his best uh, first singles win was in 1992 at the South Carolina State Championships. You know, it took him three years to get a win, but that isn't too long. It took me a lot longer than three years to get a pro win. I think it took me five years from picking up a disc. Three years for him, that's pretty solid. And then let's go over some of his stats. I think people don't realize, um, you know, besides being a five-time Masters world champion, the only player to three-peat at the Masters, win three consecutive Masters world titles. He won his fifth Masters world title by 19 strokes. So, I mean, he was a dominant Masters player. He won the Japan Masters and finished. Back then, you could double dip. You could play in both. What You could be in both divisions. So he got fourth in the Open at a major there, and he won the Masters. So, I mean, and when it comes to Masters play during his time, he was the dominator. I mean, no other players won five. So, I mean, he's got the most Masters world titles. He's got the most consecutive Masters world titles. He's got the largest win deficit of any Masters player. So I think that, you know, that's, that says enough. Now, to go into his uh, other accomplishments in the Open, he, um, you know, he did things like he was PJ Player of the Year. I mean, those, that's a hard award to win. He got third in a World Championships. He got third at a USDGC. And, you know, when he retired, he was in the top five all-time average world finish for people that played in Worlds, you know, every year. Not, nobody had uh, a better average finish but four players. He was like fourth or fifth all-time. And he was like fifth or sixth all-time in cash and wins, all these things when he retired. So, I mean, sure, a lot of his stats have been passed because the game, you know, goes up and, you know, and, and the cash goes up, so the stuff slips behind. But you got to look at where he was in his error. And he was one of the best. Um, I think that other things that I may be leaving out is uh, 
Let me see if there's anything here. No, I think that's all I wanted to cover on his stats, other than, you know, funny thing that he always said, used to say, and I agree, pound for pound, probably one of the best players of all time. I mean, he's only five foot four, 130 pounds, and he was able to compete with some, you know, pretty aggressive uh, athletic men. Now let's talk a little bit about Brad's character and Brad's uh, abilities. Uh, Brad wasn't known as distance, but he did throw the disc pretty far for a five foot four guy. You know, nicknamed the Mini Blaster back in the early days, he used to be able to rip the disc for his size and was known to be very gamesmanship. He would go after the course, he would try to score hard, and he was known to just rein in these big hyzer putts where he turned his body, kind of similar to Ron Russell, where I would tell you Ron would turn his body and then Anheuser it. Brad would turn his body, had the signature sleeve move here like this, and then just pop it with hyzer. And it would go up, loop, and bing, right in the heart. And I mean, the guy was was really good at putting. I mean, he practiced a lot. If you look at people on tour and you looked outside and you went to the course on practice days, you would see Brad Hammock practice putting. So, you, you know, it, it didn't come, you know, without practice, but the guy was really good at it. And, you know, what he was known for was making shots. He was a shot maker and he was a game man. You know, he wouldn't always make the shot that turned the head or always make every putt, but he was the guy that could step up to the situation. If he needed the putt to win his tournament, he could make that putt. If he needed to birdie three holes in a row to take the lead, he could do that. He was a gamer and he was very competitive. When it comes to his character, I know a lot of people didn't like that, you know, kind of abrasive character that he had, but I think he was kind of ahead of his time. He was a very competitive person who wanted to make a living playing disc golf. And at that point, there was only a couple of them that were doing it. Ron Russell, Al Shack, Todd Branch, our crew, you know, we were all trying, but it was very competitive to make it. So, you know, you had to live on nothing. The guy had to live in his truck and, you know, couldn't afford a hotel and couldn't afford to eat a good meal, had to eat, you know, cheap food and, and you know, scrounge to make it. And I think when you do that year after year, it eats at you and you become a little more abrasive. The, the road makes you hard. It's, I call it road rash. The tour rashes you and it makes you a little more brash and competitive because you're working so hard to try to make it. And so I think that that's where a lot of Brad's competitiveness came in. And he has always been misunderstood where his passion was taken as maybe anger or aggressiveness. So I just want to say that people like Brad Hammock, they push the sport forward and they deserve to be in the Hall of Fame for their play. And I just want to say, Brad Hammock, you are a true legend of the game. Thanks for your years of service to the PDGA and everything you did for the sport. Okay, let's wrap up the uh, podcast number four. Like I said, next uh, time, count on us for uh, podcast five, which will be fairway drivers and a couple more new releases. And let's uh, real quick recap what we did here. We had the new releases with the Legacy Pursuit and the uh, Infinite Centurion. We went over all 10 player package discs for the NG exclusives. We had a little mail call, NG team highlight, and then we did um, a, a Legends of the Game like we always do and um i just want to thank my sponsors infinite discs as you can see here team infinite and next generation tour without them this wouldn't be possible i want to thank my family cynthia and leo max for being behind me and helping me succeed in life and just want to say until then we'll see you on podcast number five this was number four disc golf and honest take this is dave felbert thanks